evening. Good evening. I'm Larry Souter, and welcome to Stories of Amazing Grace. We're coming to you from Bixter Chapel at the Madison Church of Christ in Madison, Tennessee. Thank you for joining us online. Some are listening by way of radio and for this live audience. Glad that you're here. And if you'd like to be part of this audience, come see us first Wednesday of the month, Madison Church of Christ, Bixter Chapel, and we're glad to have you. Well, our theme scripture comes from Romans 8, 38 through 39. I'm sure that nothing can separate us from God's love, not life, or death, not angels or spirits, not the present or the future, and not powers above or powers below. Nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, tonight's guest is Sandy Jones. She woke up one morning as usual, but within 24 hours she was paralyzed from the waist down. Sandy describes herself as a strong-willed individual who enjoyed riding her motorcycle. She lives by herself and is assisted with her mobility with the help of two great Danes, and they're with us tonight. Sandy says God has been at work in her life, and if it will help others, she wants to share her story. And you'll hear her story right after this. Illness just invaded her overnight. Um, it, it didn't give any warning. Uh, one day we're out on a boat having a ball and um, going where we want to go. And then she falls out on the floor. And the whole life changed from that day forward for both of us. Um, for both of us. Sandy is one of the most loving, caring people I've ever known. The strength is so deep within her. The caring that she has for people is very deep. I don't know that I could do what Sandy has done through all of this. The doctors didn't think Sandy would do what she has done. I'm amazed Wait. by the strength that she has, the caring that she still tries to take care of so many people in the shape that she's in. God, God is her willpower. She was always uh, at church. She was uh, in women's classes. They, um, she, was, she always wants to do something for somebody all the time. How she made you better? Just being my friend. Just, um, we listen to each other. We cry together. When this happened, I went to the hospital and crawled in bed with her and just sit and cry. Nobody knows the depth of this um, except the ones that have been front and center. Uh, Johnny, uh, who has passed on, um, I've tried to be here every chance I get. To help her. My girl, my girl. And then it's so rewarding to see the steps that she makes, and I mean the steps, the walking, that she was never supposed to do, ever. She was going to be in a wheelchair, and that was it. She proved us all wrong. She had very bad thoughts, which most people with this disease that goes this far with the disease, have the negative light wanting to live. Yeah. They don't want to live. And um, Sandy wants to live, or she wouldn't have came this far. And this foot, I can actually bring three toes up, and my foot will come up some. It doesn't go down well. Mm -hmm. And this one, I've learned with the core, with the brace, I drive with the heel okay. pushing down on it. Yeah. So, and um, if I climb stairs, I have to do them like sideways mm -hmm. where my feet fold up on them. Like on the yeah. boat when I get back in from the water uh -huh. or from the swimming pool. Uh -huh. And when they give me shots, I say, 
That's sad. Because <laughs> I don't feel it. I don't feel it at all. <laughs> Please make welcome Sandy Jones. Come, 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 step, walk, step, lady, lady, walk, okay. Let Mama sit. Now, Thor, down, down. Lady, lady, come. No, no, right here. Down. That deserves some applause. Again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Well, I looked up the definition says it's a rare neurological condition caused by inflammation of your spinal cord, often results in sudden symptoms such as muscle weakness, pain, bladder dysfunction. It has several possible causes. Some people recover from the symptoms and result in complications, while others do not. That's the definition, but you have experienced it and you have had some great progress with the help of your friend Corky, which we uh, saw earlier. So how did it all begin? It was an instant type thing that happened? Yeah. Um, my late husband, Johnny, and I had been in the Keys, uh, fishing, riding bikes, horses, and we had to come home for a few things. And I uh, had a business of my own um, and got up that morning to go visit see how all my kids were. I started having some real hot pain in my back, and I thought, that doesn't feel right. Got dressed, went on to the car, and then it got worse. And it was like a, a squeeze. They call it a squeeze, and it goes around your body, and it, it's like it takes all of your life. Um, I thought I was having a heart attack, so I, I made it back into the house, um, called my husband, and he said, call 911. I can't get there in time, so I did. By that point, I could hardly speak, and they stayed on the phone with me until uh, the ambulance got there. They came in. Um, I told them that I could walk to the gurney, and um, I did. My knees felt real buckly. Uh, got out, got inside. They took me to the closest hospital, mm -hmm. and inside I went. The problem is, is that transverse myelitis is so rare that doctors, not all doctors even know about it. They may have heard it, but they didn't study it. And that, in this case, that's what happened in the ER that I was sent to. Um, to have immediate care is very, very important, like a stroke. Um, I should have been put on mega steroids right then, it was not. Um, what did they think it was initially? They did, they did a CT and um, they said, well, you've got a bad back. And I said, well, I know that. Uh, riding horses and everything of my lifestyle, that's yes, but this is not what it is, doctor. And he said, well, I don't see any ruptured disc and I just see, you know, and um, he said, uh, can you give a urine sample? And I said, yes. Walked to the bathroom, walked back. In the process of a few hours being there, my bladder had already stopped working and was uh, retaining. And the pain was very bad, and I started asking them to please cath. Uh, it was retaining a lot and um, I couldn't feel my right foot. Mm. So he comes in and he says, well, 
your symptoms are all over the board, and we're going to send, send you home and follow up with specialist. And I said, Doctor, something is inside of me taking my life. Mm. He said, well, I'm not keeping you just because you think you should stay. Mm. And I said, sir, I'm not a person to want to be in the hospital, but I'm telling you there is something wrong. He goes out. He sends the release form in a wheelchair, and he sends me home with a catheter with a leg bag and to follow up with urology and neurology. So we get in the truck. By then, I can't, I can't stand on this right leg. But when a doctor says, you know, there's really nothing wrong with you, go home, take these pain meds, go check in with some specialists. So we got there at the house, and by then, I'm already having a spasms, and my legs would extreme out like the exorcist movies that you've seen. And uh, I had to scoot into the house on my bottom. So through the night, I'm laying there, and my pain is horrible. And I know that something's taking my body over, but I'm like, okay, I'm supposed to be okay tomorrow, but how am I going to get in to see these specialists? Something's not right. Pain got worse. I prayed. I prayed and prayed. And I'm not a person that thinks that, oh, you know, poor me, it's like they said I was going to be better, so I should be better. This time, it wasn't. And uh, God, he told me to go to Vanderbilt. He said, you need to go to Vanderbilt. And it was inside, he told me this. Um, I woke my husband up, and I said, you've got to take me to Vanderbilt. So by then, I couldn't even walk to the car. It was quite comical, us getting me out. He tried to put me on a blanket and slide me out. Mm. He said, okay, put your feet on my feet. I'll dance you out. That didn't work. Uh, and at that time, I had a French Mastiff puppy, and he thought it was fun to try to get on mm. the blanket. We, it was... We got, we got to the truck, and it, it was bad. We pulled into Vanderbilt. He goes in. They come out. At that point, they just got me in there fast, and at that point, I was a code without knowing it. it um, they did spinal taps. They did MRIs, which was not done at the other hospital, and it took... MRIs to see what was going on. They didn't know what it was, but they knew what was happening within two hours. Uh, at that point, I already had a seven and a half inch lesion on my spinal cord, and it was close to taking my breathing ability. So everything was stat, and um, they started steroids. Steroids, they said, you'll be better tomorrow. And I thought, well, good. We can get on out of here. I'll be okay. Um, four o'clock, the next morning, I wake up. They had drugged me pretty heavily. Um, and I see Johnny sitting in a chair. He's asleep. And I'm trying to take inventory. Well, I couldn't take inventory because I couldn't feel anything. Hmm. My body was completely not belonging to me. Um, it, was, it wasn't there. I tried to turn in the bed. I couldn't turn in the bed. I tried to move. I couldn't move. And I'm laying there, and I'm like, this can't be happening. This just can't be happening. And... I told God, I said, um, I can't do this. How am I going to do this 
in my lifestyle. My lifestyle is doing and going and adventurous. This, I can't do this. How? How will I do this? And um, the next round of doctors came through about seven. My improvement wasn't good enough. They offered plasmapheresis, which was sort of new at that point in time for, for certain things. And it's where they put ports into the heart and they will pump out your plasma and they will clean it and put some back in and they'll put other plasma in with it. What it does, it takes out the antibodies. The antibodies were attacking my spinal cord. That was the problem. So they said, there's a lot of risk. I said, what have I got to lose? Mm. Let's do it. So they started that morning, and I stayed in Vanderbilt for uh, seven days, uh, four and a half to five hours a day, where they continued to take the, the plasma out and take the antibodies out. And it did start taking a, a stop. So at that point, I, I can't move. I can't do anything. And they bring, they introduce a wheelchair, and I'm looking at that, and I'm going. That's not for you. And they, at that point, I also, my bladder had failed, and so did the bowels, the colon, which is a common thing that this disease takes out. Um, and therapy was the, next, was the next move to send me to Stallworth. I stayed in Vanderbilt for three months. Mm -hmm. They said that in, it was, in three months was my window to get as much back as I could. My brain needed to start talking to the part that it forgot about mm -hmm. already because the, my, the transverse goes across and the myelitis strips all the uh, uh, myelin in the sheaths from the nerves. And it's like electrical lines that are just crazy and that doesn't grow back. But I wasn't feeling it. I was completely paralyzed. Um, but they said in three months, those nerves will die if they don't have some connection. That's your window. So I went to work. And um, um, they asked me when, they, when, when I went in with the wheelchair, they came, and there was only one therapist that knew about transverse myelitis. She had read on it at one point. No one there knew about it. So I was sort of a medical journal. People would come in and uh, learn, learn from you about it, I yes. guess. Yes, yes, because it was so strange. And, um, but I had a good PT, another God thing. I mean, people don't know about it, so your best thing is, is that they just want to get you in a comfort zone and then send you home. Um, she, she, they asked me when I walked in, when I rolled in, what is your goal? Right. I said, well... I want to pee, poop, and walk. There you go. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and the head of the uh, operations there, he kind of jumped back, and then he just started laughing. He said, well, we know our goal then. <laughs> so <laughs> Did you ask God why? Why me? No. I've never asked God why. Never. Um, I've asked God um, how can I do this? How can I do this? Um, I don't believe that God punishes us. I don't believe that I, this happened so I could do what I'm doing today. I, my belief is, is that when things happen, it's how we choose 
to use it or not use it. And uh, I, I just, I just knew that he was there. He sent me there. And I asked him how I was going to do this. He gave me the people that showed me how to do this. And the therapist that was head there that worked with me so hard, she, the very next morning, put the wheelchair up on the little thing that's got the bars. She says, you want to walk? She says, let's see what you got. Hmm. I grabbed the bars. And um, it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life is to pull the body up because I'm pulling a dead body up that I don't feel. But see, I rode horses, athletic. I had the upper strength, so it happened. And it gave me encouragement because I got up regardless. And... The next day, she hands me a walker. Let's get up. Okay. I got up, and I took two steps. I couldn't feel this, but it's a matter of training your brain to do Mm -hmm. what you don't feel. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of how that works. Um, When I... When they told me to do five more of whatever, I did five more and then five more. Mm-hmm. I, God did show me. He gave me that tenacity um, because it would have been easier for me not to have done it. And uh, then when I... I when I was going home, oh, and I said, I'm going to walk out of here. And um, they wheeled me down the day I was leaving in my chair, and uh, which all that got fitted, braces, all of that. And when I got before around the corner, they said, here's your walker. Walk out of here. And I did. And I turned the corner. And everybody there was lined up, and they were applauding, and they were crying. Wow. They gave me the strength to finish walking out of there because I didn't think I could make it out of there on the walker, but they gave me that strength, and it was... It, it, every corner, there's been someone or some people that's given me more reason to push further. I got home, uh, which was scary because I was just pulling up on the walker, and if I turned even do a light switch, I'd fall. Mm -hmm. Uh, The head of uh, the MS clinic, which this is similar to MS, but it's not MS, and he sent a letter saying, your three months has passed, you've, you've lost your window, appreciate where you are, and enjoy your life. Mm. And I'll see you in eight months. Uh, I fell to the floor. <laughs> And it's the first time I was really mad. I was mad. And I was, I was hitting the floor with my fist. I didn't say, God, why'd you do this? Uh, I, just, I just was mad. I was mad at that doctor for telling me that. And I moped around. I pitied myself for a few days, and then I decided that 
Why do I have to listen to him? Hmm. So I said, God, here I go. What I used to get my butt whipped for every day, being hard-headed, finally paid off. <laughs> Where did the dogs come into the picture? Well, there's a process, a big process. Number one, there's also another thing that was told, no. Um, learn to walk with the walker, be happy. And I was in my wheelchair most of the time at the house for safety. Um, then I decided I'm going to put some crutches. You can't do crutches because you can't stabilize. Well, I got crutches anyway. I fell a whole lot. Um, but I started walking with crutches. Then the PT that was in Vanderbilt, she goes to uh, uh, Shepherd's in uh, Atlanta, which is the spinal cord center to be. She tells me where she's at. She says, I think I can get you in on outpatients. We loaded up the RV and we stayed at campgrounds and I went every day to Shepherd Center. She graduated me to arm crutches, mm -hmm. uh, which is some of them where you saw me climbing up with, the, mm -hmm. and then they take my feet, people on each side, and they make my feet go in motion because I didn't know about my feet. They were, I didn't know, I couldn't feel them. So, doing very well there, and I fell, and I broke my right knee. Mm. <laughs> so now I'm back in a wheelchair for three months, non-weight bearing, and I had to leave Shepherds. Um, Thor. And uh, so anyway, I go home, not happy, and back up, and I had to start all over again because your brain starts forgetting Thor. And so, anyway, um, I had Great Danes pets before, mm -hmm. and they used to walk against my leg. I've always had big animals, horses, Danes. They were, it's okay. And so, anyway, um, I said, I want to I wanna get a Great Dane. I think, because when I'd fall, Thor, come, come Thor. You down. Come on, you don't get to do that. He's only two years old and 175 pound body. And come on, he's still in training. Down, down, good baby. <laughs> so anyway, I, uh, when I'd fall with crutches, I couldn't get back up. I, I had no stability. So I decided to look for a surface dog or one that I would train. And um, I was turned down most places because of age. Most places had a five-year waiting list. And I'm like, I may not have five years. I've got to do this now. Uh -huh. And um, um, I found this place in Ipwich, Massachusetts that that's all they do is they raise Great Danes for balance mobility. Doctors, family, friends, mm, can't do that. You, you don't understand. You don't have that much stability. Well, I applied. They turned me down, turned me down, and I kept applying. So at, after a little bit, they said, okay, can you be here, and we'll interview you. Yes, I can. Um, I had a major surgery that they were about to do, and I put it off. And my doctors were so good that they were okay with it because it took a lot of planning. It was a six-hour surgery um, that they were going to um, relocate my appendix mm. where I've got a hole right here, and I put a catheter, and I get to flush an IV bottle of water, which is how the colon works now. And uh, the transverse myelitis had damaged my bladder, 
the pelvic floor, uh, three teams of doctors, and they worked on me for six hours. Um, and I, another medical thing that when I go to the hospital, they all come and like, well, what is a mace? What you know? So that there's that. So we put that off. We went. Uh, I interviewed. As a matter of fact, I stayed for a whole week. They, I don't know if it was just being uh, Southern and they're not used to Southern people because they're kind of grumpy up that way. And uh, so, so you ha you have to try out with the dog to see if there's a, a fit. A fit and uh, personality-wise, size-wise. But the important thing is, is that the dog has to choose you. Hmm. You don't get to choose the dog. So they took all the information down. They, they studied, uh, went home. It normally takes a year or longer. Three months, they called me, said, can you be back up here? And that, I prayed for every night. Mm -hmm. I prayed to please let me get a dog. I did. Um, three months. Went back there, and they said, we're going to put you up in a cabin. They did. And Lady Ripple was laying there on the sofa. And uh, we stayed together for three days, no one around. And then they came and they said, we're going to let her out. She's going to run and be free. And let's just see what she does. She went back out with her litter mates. And as soon as she ran with them for a second, she came back over and she stood at the gate wanting to come back to me. So she chose me, and uh, she became my, my best friend. When you go out to eat, uh, people look at you, according to your notes here, with pity. Yes. But the dogs help that situation. I'm a very prideful person, uh, which is not a good trait, but it is the truth. And used to, my hair was messed up, or I got something on my shirt, mm, got to go change, got to fix that. When you walk in with walkers and crutches, people try to be nice. They don't mean to look, but they do. And they wonder. And a lot of people will come over and ask, oh, was you in a car wreck? Did you have a stroke? Um, and all you want to do is to blend and walk in and just be okay and not be that, that, that person. Because uh, pity, I don't have room for that, and I don't want to feel like that when I go somewhere. And when Lady Ripple came into my life, we go somewhere, oh my gosh, everyone's just so busy looking at her and how wonderful she is, and how well behaved she is, and that hopefully he will be one day. And, uh, <laughs> and it's, it became a pride. I am with her. I am so lucky that I get to walk in with Lady Ripple. Mm. And it, it, it was a game changer for me on my self-esteem. Um, it, it was like, and now, I mean, she dress, I dress her up in outfits and we do, uh, we, we do different costumes. She's got, oh my gosh, she's got more of a wardrobe than I do. And, but it's like dressing up one of my child and I have so much pride in her. And when I fall, she picks me back up. Then, and I've had a good husband during all this too. I don't want to leave that out. He stayed and was there 
at all times. And you used to go motorcycle riding even after the transfers. Oh yeah, he he got me a Can Am. Now that was before, but I, he got another one that was a semi-automatic, and they fixed the brake and floorboards, so my I, I didn't know where my feet were. So I rode. He and I we rode bikes still. I, and, and I, horses, I got back on the horses. They had to help me up. But right. yeah, I mean, we, we lived life to, to the best that we could. And- um, Tragedy struck him. We, in, in 2020, when the um, uh, COVID thing, uh, which is exactly when she came home with me, um, he had had some, many little mini seizures and they had done MRIs and uh, CTs of his brain s some years before and this time they d they did the brain scan and the neurologist called us and we were on uh, FaceTime and he he gave us the news that my husband's brain had shrunk considerably and he was in uh, onset Alzheimer's. Mm. His mother had passed away of the same disease. This was his worst nightmare in life to ever think that could happen. So we had new challenges ahead. Uh, he went into a deep depression. Um, he kind of stayed that way. I, I would have too. Um, it, it, it got difficult those last two years, uh, but we, he wanted to, to get a condo and be on the water and fish in Florida, so we bought one and um, thought that this was going to really help diversify his thinking, and we get there, and I get, well, he had been being sick. I get sick because I'm probably in the hospital three, four times a year. That's, that's just a normal thing for me. Uh, I get so many infections. And now they want to do the plasma every six months. There's that to deal with too. Um, so we were always so busy worrying about me getting COVID and I wouldn't make it. Um, and we got there, I started running high fever, and we automatically, okay, we got the infection, go to the ER, and they do the COVID test, and I've got COVID. Um, he had been coughing for weeks. The doctor said he probably had it, and that's where I got it. Um, he got worse. Long story short, we both ended up in the hospital, same floor, five rooms apart, and we were both very, very sick. He was doing better. They were going to um, uh, start working him to go home with home health care. They said that I couldn't yet. So the ninth day, I did start improving and they started talking about me going home. And I said, well, we need to go with the same agency. And they said, Miss Sandy, uh, Johnny's not going to go home yet. He took a turn for the worse last night. Mm -hmm. um, they started pushing 45 liters of air with a um, CPAP. They sent me home all by myself with COVID and still I couldn't breathe well. And I'm in a condo where no one could really take care of me because of the COVID. So that was very challenging. Uh, after a while, Corky and Mike came down and they were a lifesaver. Uh, and they were taking me back and forth to see Johnny. Uh, they'd suit me up. Lady Ripple, we'd suit her up and go into the room and I, they said, you can't get close. And I said, no. Climbed in the bed and 
we usually would nap. Uh, then they'd make me go home. And um, Johnny's 19th day, I was there, and I didn't like the way he looked, and I wanted to stay. They wouldn't let me stay. Uh, they made me go. I just got home, and I get a phone call. What are his wishes? Mm. I said, resuscitate. We both have said that because we're both very resilient. Um, they said, it won't do any good. I said, I don't believe you. I think you don't want to take care of him because mm. you're overworked. I said, you do whatever you've got to do until I get there. So they get me back to the hospital. And ironically, his son and he had been estranged for quite a while, as well as me being estranged from mine. Uh, when I was in the hospital going through this, my, my son and I, I didn't get to see my son uh, through this, but he and his son had made their peace, and they'd come in to see him. So I called them. They were, they were able to meet me at the ER, and they showed us um, where it wasn't possible. All I could do was put him through more pain. And so I had to make a decision. Mm. Um, two and a half hours before it, it ended, and I prayed for his life. It, it wasn't fair because he was, always, he was always a better Christian, a better everything than me. Mm -hmm. um, he, he was just so much better than me. He deserved to not go in my mind. And when he did... I was extremely mad at God. And um, I felt like I felt like God had let me down. The one thing I had asked him for, he didn't do. <laughs> and I questioned my faith for quite a while. Um, thanks to several good friends, two of which were in my Bible study group, uh, Terry and Joanne, and they didn't give up on me. No, you've got to stay. Thor, down. And um, they hung with me. They didn't, they didn't do anything but just, I'd say, okay, I'm going to give you a time to come visit me and explain this or explain that. I said, I, I'm lost. And um, during this time, my son and I had been estranged and I had prayed every night for God to soften his, for God to soften his heart, lady, down, down, to soften his heart, his heart. How about a treat, honey? <laughs> I would do something, but I'm afraid to touch him. <laughs> <laughs> it says, "Do not pet." So I don't. <laughs> um, You've seen, some of you have seen the movie Mother of Dragons. I think that sort of suits me with these animals. Um, but um, I pray for my son's heart to soften, to at least remember the love and everything that we had because I was a single mom and we were always so close. And I had already, I was so empty that I... I didn't think that would ever happen. And in the process of all this, my son makes contact with me. And, 
And he, he today lives there on, on the property. And he's, he's everything. He's, he's doing everything to help me because I was there by myself. And um, being without Johnny or anything and being in these conditions, it's, it was pretty scary. And my son came back. And I, I realized that God said, Thor, come here, come. That God said, you don't get to be mad at me. Hmm. Let me show you. Let me show you. And I knew it. I knew that's what he, he sent me, my son. He gave me reason to move forward. Mm -hmm. And, but I was still angry about Johnny. And through the help of these friends and so many of the friends that are, I see out here that I, We've been friends. Some of us went to school together. Some of us were 40 and 50 year old friends that are sitting out here and they're all in my life. But I was a selfish person for being mad at God, for taking Johnny. Because Johnny's future was not good. And it was going to be, he was going to have to suffer through the one thing he didn't want to suffer. And I realized that it was selfish of me. And that God did bless him. It wasn't about me. It was about him and God. And I'm sure that if God gave him a choice and said, okay, you can stay here, you're going to ride all this out, and you know what you got, or you, and, and, and you can be with Sandy and, and your family, or you can come on home to me. And I know Johnny would have made that decision. Would you uh, be willing to take some questions or comments from yes. the audience? If anybody has any. Tell us about the story of uh, Lady Ripple that you tell the story of your adventures with Lady Ripple on Facebook. Oh, uh, Lady Ripple has her own Facebook page, in case anyone would like to look it up. And, and it goes all the way back to the beginning of us. And Lady Ripple tells her story and her perspective of what we do. No matter what we're doing, she has a different perspective. And, um, oh, yes, she's got lots of opinions about Thor. <laughs> her, her brother is very annoying. She doesn't understand why he cannot be as good as her. And that we should just leave him behind. We don't really need him. Now, you, you raise uh, Great Danes also, don't you? The people that were, that raised Lady Ripple, a couple of the trainers um, went on their own, and they wanted to start raising more Danes because uh, they, they usually go to veterans first and then the family of veterans unless they have a dog that, like Lady Ripple, she's really very petite, as you can see, compared to Thor. And um, a guy she wouldn't have been very good with. She's extremely timid, as you can see. She likes to kind of, you know, kind of stay back. Um, but our personalities and our size uh, worked. And that was another reason I think I got her so soon. But anyway, they couldn't start this, this organization unless they had litters, and they didn't have anywhere to do litters. So with Johnny passing, I had the garage, and we had offices upstairs, 
and turn it into a two bedroom. So they came to live with me for this past year and they had a litter of uh, 10 puppies. Mm. And so they've just recently gone back to New Hampshire. They're uh, nine months old. Uh, and it's time now for them to be with several trainers and, and, and do the final phases of, of matching them with, uh, with other people. So, yes, we had the 10 Danes there. And um, it, it, was, it was a way to pass it forward. Mm-hmm. It was a way to pass it forward because Lady has... Um, changed my life so much. And Lady is five, and she's going to need to retire in the next couple of years, and this is where Thor comes in at. He will take her retirement, and she still gets to go, but she doesn't have to work with my weight or anything like that. Gotcha. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. I, too, have transverse myelitis. Do you? And I had a similar experience with you. And my question is, why I ended up at a hospital, didn't send home like you, and I ended up at St. Thomas West, and they immediately knew I had transverse myelitis. So my question is, why didn't they drain the fluid off your spine? That was an option for me. And when that happened, then I, too, was put on steroids. So, and then had to go to physical therapy and all that kind of stuff. So were you given that option? All right, how long ago has it been? Um, let's see, this is 2023, a year, a year almost two years. Okay. No, it's been a year ago. Okay, this happened to me in 2016. Um, and it is idiopathic. Uh, they couldn't find a reason why this happened, they did drain the fluid from my spine in the ER right there. It was all stat. Um, it, they knew that it was one of three things at that point. In 2000, the, the uh, transverse myelitis was only discussed or even discovered uh, in um, 19... Uh, it was, uh, it was in the early 80s before it, it, anyone has ever been diagnosed with transverse myelitis. So it depended on the hospital. Uh, St. Thomas was a good hospital for you to go to. Um, and I, I'm not going to mention the hospital that sent me home. Um, but um, they knew more with you. Um, from people, there are two. There are two other people that I had met that has the had transverse myelitis. One is laying as a vegetable because she didn't have the insurance, and they stuck her in a home, and so she lost all ability. Hers was in the C-section. Her arms do what my legs and feet do. Uh, if given the chance, she, she could have walked, but now she can't because she's been in the bed too long. Um, the other one, she had been diagnosed. She was sent home from the same hospital. Same thing happened. And the next day, she was paralyzed neck down. Um, they took her back and started the steroids and all of that. Um, Hers was a year sooner than mine, 15. Um, We lost her two years ago. Um, She was only in her 50s. This disease takes no prisoners. It will affect in different parts of your body. Doesn't matter who you are. Uh, There's no rhythm to it. Some people that have MS can go into the transverse myelitis as well. Uh, But there's a lot of us that is idiopathic, and they don't know why it happened. So it's really hard to do anything when they they don't know why. 
I don't know, but went with me, they knew it could have been one of three things. And that was the Gilliam Beret, the transverse myelitis, and the other one was uh, a defix. Those were the three options that they knew that was happening, but it was only going to, it just took time. Um, and my spinal cord did not go into a remission for a whole year. So the damage, when, when your, uh, when your uh, the lesion, the fluid comes out, then you've got scar. So now you've got a, a spinal cord that's got scar, that's scarred. Uh, how, how do you know how, how long your lesion was? Some are just on one disc. Well, they said I would never walk. I was, I was paralyzed from my breast down. Yes. I had no feeling. And I still lack feeling in my feet and my abdomen is still messed up. Right. But they didn't expect me to walk. Right. And I Look said, yes, I will. So, yes, yeah. you will. And they wouldn't let me walk with a walker. They gave me canes and so that I wouldn't hump over with yeah. a walker and the physical therapy and work me three hours a day. It was really wonderful. But yeah, and I've had a remission just this year. Awesome. And yeah, and I'm steroids again, so I just keep exercising. Have you ever asked them about the plasmapheresis? Well, they offered that to me and I turned it down. Oh. It sounded too scary. It is scary. You can bleed out. Um, they had to stop mine several times. They bring bags of calcium and have to put calcium back in my body. Uh, I did bleed out twice. Uh, one of the times was on my way home uh, a year ago, no, two years ago, while my husband was alive. And we got to the driveway and I started coughing. And I kept coughing and all of a sudden, psh, all over the windshield. And I'm grabbing my neck, and he's, I'm going to turn around. No, I'll bleed to death. Get, get to, let's get to the house. So we got ice packs and held it, and, you know, we did our own triage. But that's the danger of it. You can bleed out, but there's infections. And, yeah, it's quite dangerous. But I, my attitude was, what have I got to lose? I just trust. I just Everything that has transpired, I just knew it'd be okay. I, had come, I just knew it would be okay. And don't let anyone put an expiration date on you. Never. Keep going because it's been seven years, the end of March for me, and I'm still making some progress at some points, don't ever give up. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. I want to conclude with uh, something from the last page of your notes that you gave me. The doctors cannot understand how I walk with feet that drop, one side paralyzed, the other, other partially paralyzed, and no balance to walk on my own. The procedures I go through daily to function with a bowel I cannot tell is there, a bladder that has to be emptied with a catheter, all the infections, hospitals, and plasma. God has put doctors in my life willing to think out of the norm. And now I am independent with two kids, Lady Ripple and Sir Thor, plus my son, Brian. With God, all things are possible. Yes. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for joining us on Stories of Amazing Grace, and we'll see you next time, everybody, on Stories of Amazing Grace.